Welcome to the I Am Lug 2013 keynote brought to you by IBM, Team Studio, PSC, and GBS, our platinum and gold sponsors. Lewis Richardson of IBM, along with Kirk Bowman of Zipline, are our keynote speakers. Ready. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, thank Oh, gee, thanks. All right, as, you, as promised, it's 9 o'clock, so we're going. We're getting started for the rest of the stragglers. They'll get here in a few minutes. So welcome, everybody, to year number four of I Am Lug. Uh, we had a brief interruption as we reorganized the time to get the Social Business Roadshow in here for you guys. So we actually added uh, about six more sessions to this event. So this is being live, you know, live streamed to everybody so we can wave. We already have viewers that are online back there as well as we're recording it. Um, so you guys know all the sessions are recorded. Uh, attendees only will have full access to the entire suite. So we provide full access for you guys to go back. If you need to go to one session, you can still go online, and it takes me a couple weeks to get everything edited and uploaded, but you can watch all the sessions, all right? So we capture the audio and everything else. If you do not see the presenter slides up there, do not email us. Email the presenters. I would like to point to some of the presenters that you can email. Now, some of, some of them send them in on time, and they're fighting about it still like children. They're both in the front. All right, easy enough. First, we have to thank the sponsors, definitely. Uh, they're what made it happen. They made the event totally free for you guys. So, one of your jobs is that you will go and talk to them while you're here. It's your only job to give them a few minutes of your time. The welcome reception Monday night, which is tonight, is here in this theater also. So during the day, we'll cover logistics. We'll be over there. We'll talk about it in a minute. But you'll be back here in the evening time. This will be totally rearranged for some stuff for the nighttime. But that's the first set of sponsors and, of course, the rest of the sponsors. We should give them applause as well. So one of your jobs is definitely spend a few minutes with them, thank them for sponsoring everything, including all the food that you guys get, the meetings, helping organize, the AV, everything that's done is because of them. Uh, what makes the event free? Without it, it wouldn't happen. All right, well, the, the time that we spend on it, but we'll get to that too <laughs> in just a minute. So what do you know? We start on time as we did. Uh, all the sessions go on time, whether your presenter's in the room or not, we start. If your presenter's late, that means they lose time on their session. Seriously, it keeps us on track. We don't run behind. As you saw, we started. People are still wandering in. Please feel free. Find a seat. Welcome to my friends from Canada. Yes, they're waving now. <laughs> if anyone has hockey tickets, he's looking for hockey tickets, apparently, for this one. Uh, fill out your evals. We do something different here at IMLUG. Every session you go into, you'll be handed a paper eval. When you leave the room, turn it in. The reason being is not only do we correlate them all, but we give the speakers back a copy of every eval. We scan them and email them to them. So they see your feedback. If they're awesome, let them know. If they're not, let them know. If something's wrong with what we did, let us know. If you really have a big complaint, don't let us know. But in that general theme, I want you guys to fill out your evals. There's also a full conference eval, and we read every one of those. So make sure you do those. Take the two seconds while you're in there. Uh, you'll be handed well on the way in. Just hand them back on the way out. It's all you got to do, all right? while you guys are in there, pay attention. Wear your badge, the reason being there's two other events going on in the casino complex. Uh, we need to keep the Teamsters out of our food. <laughs> the Teamsters will be in the missing room where we don't use downstairs in the meeting rooms, and they also be in here for like two hours in the middle of the day. So uh, wear your badges. There will be security later, seriously. Uh, casino security is being brought in just to make sure. There's so many of you this year, which we'll talk about. I needed to get some extra help just making sure we cover the edges. If you don't have a badge on, they won't let you in. All right? So that goes for food and the sessions, OK? Tracks. These are the room letters. It's the way we do it. The A room is the admin track. D is dev. E is everything else. And the C will be the new connect track. We've always done it that way. It works well. Uh, so if you have a question where you should be, if you're a developer, don't go to the A room. You will be heckled profusely during that whole day in the A room, just so you know. It's the way we run things. Logistics. Uh, as you guys know, the keynote, you know where breakfast is. There will also be lunch served in the atrium. Uh, all breaks will be done in the sponsor areas. So all day coffee. Where's Julian? It's his fault. So we have all day coffee. I believe he puts it on every eval, including Lotusphere, which causes him to have all-day coffee. Uh, there'll be snacks in the afternoon as well as it. There'll be also uh, water in every room. We'll have water in the back, and then there'll be some tea out as well for those who want some hot tea. Otherwise, lunch and breakfast will be down there in the atrium. Uh, lunch. We run lunch for an hour and 45 minutes for a reason. The second part of lunch is called Sponsor Spotlight. 
It is optional for you to do, but the sponsors are given the meeting rooms and they can tell you which sponsors in which room to actually provide you a half hour of demo time of their products. So if you're really interested in a particular product or solution or whatever it is, you can go to one of those the last part of lunch, you can take your lunch with you, it doesn't matter. But you can actually see the full solution, ask questions and do everything. Please visit those, those are done both days. Uh, you should have a list in your agendas to tell you which sponsors are in which room. I know a bunch of them are participating. So there's eight possibilities you can do over the two days with those. It's the second half of lunch. Uh, otherwise, we start in the mornings. Uh, tomorrow morning's an early morning. We run all day. You are, if you have to leave early, no problem. Just do your full conference eval for me. No issue there. Uh, if you have to leave early for something else and you need something from us, let us know. We'll be glad to help you. Uh, the theater, you'll be back tonight. Uh, there's a few surprises. I don't want to ruin them yet. But tonight, you may want to be at the welcome reception if you were planning on it. So Twitter and all that stuff, I am Lug. Uh, I don't plan on trending, but at least we can let people know there are people watching. We had people on the stream before this even started this morning. So the live stream has a bunch of people involved, as well as we record the keynote, as everyone knows, and we put that online. So it'll be up on YouTube later for you guys to watch. So don't worry about that. If you need to share it with people, you can, because we have some great keynote speakers that are going to be coming up. And we also have a surprise there that wasn't on the main thing for those that paid attention. But use I am Lug. If you take Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want to do, we can find it that way as well. So please do it. But there is trending that started already. This is all you all care about. <laughs> I'm proud to say that I Am Lug probably has the best food of any user group. We don't claim to be the biggest. We claim to have the best, right? Right. So we probably have some of the best food. Uh, breakfast is heavier than usual, but lunch, yeah, we, we want you guys to almost be napping in the speaker sessions after lunch. We do big lunches uh, both days. So don't think you're going to not get enough food at this one. Plus, we do a snack in the afternoon that's also huge. I don't remember which snack is which day. Tomorrow's the healthy day because we want you to recover, but today's the kill you with like sweet goodiness day. And then tonight is even worse because we fill you up at the reception. All right, there's more surprises there with that. So that's going to be there. All right, there was over 225 registrants this year. Um, largest year yet. We actually closed registration. Um, the hotel sold out Sunday night and Monday night. So there was no rooms left, which is impressive. You guys can sit down. It's like 30 people standing in the back. It's okay. Or you can sit on the floor if you want to, Victor. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that one. No, over 225 registrants, we have four countries, and then I said, forget stats, we don't need to know about it, it doesn't really matter at that point. So that's one of the big pieces, but 30 speakers, I want you guys to know, there's over 10, 10 IBM champions here. That's impressive, anywhere you go. Those that don't know what champions are, it doesn't really matter then. Uh, <laughs> at that point, I think, how many are in the front row? How many champions? One, two, were you the one before? Oh, a former, ch former champion, that's even more impressive. He was the original round. Five, who else is a champion? It's six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's, where's Kathy's back in the back? Kathy's back there. So you have over ten champions. That means they dedicate their time and a lot of information for free. They blog, they podcast, they run X pages demos. They, I don't know what Julian does. They do stuff that develop stuff, give away free tools. Russ plays with beans or something like that. Is that what the session is, beans? All right. So they give away a lot of free content, so you guys should definitely make sure you connect with a lot of them and also all the other speakers, because a lot of them provide so much good information that's out there. Uh, proud to say to have 10 of them here is an awesome accomplishment. I think last year we had 10 as well, so that was a good start for the thing. Planning. I don't know if they're up here because the lights are on, but uh, we should, we're going to give applause anyway to um, Katie and Susan and Kathy that helped everybody else. They're the ones that helped organize this event. We should give them, give them a round of applause and thank them. Um, I don't think, I see Joanne too. Yeah, I see Joanne and Brent. Uh, so they, we dedicate our time to do this. So we do it for free, so you guys know. Um, I usually sleep for four days when it's done, only because it's, it's a lot of time drain, but we enjoy it, so you know. Uh, Katie, all your graphics. Katie handled all that. Susan handles logistics pretty much, and then they keep me in line the rest of the time. Uh, Kathy did a bunch of extra dev work. Joanne's here nonstop. Mr. Calhoun and his wife help with the bags. We have a whole bunch of volunteers that make this event happen. So it's a big deal. It's all volunteer. It's all nonprofit. There's no money made on the events. We basically run the event and give back to you guys, okay? It's one of the biggest things. So if you have questions about where something goes or does, let us know. We can tell you where it is. Anybody with a shirt on should be able to tell you exactly what you need or what room it's in, okay? In the bag. How many of you already threw away your bag? Honestly. There's a couple. Cause there's cleaning cart ladies that already have our bag. I swear. <laughs> there is. So every year, the, they love us because a few of you leave it behind. In your bags, you will have a bunch of cool stuff from the sponsors as well as some cards to fill out for some drawings. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. So make sure you don't just toss it. Make sure you read what's in there first before you give them away and go visit the sponsors because there will be some giveaways based on those that are in there. And we don't have more. 
We actually had to stop registration at the point of the number of bags. What? Tell them to hold up their hand if they have three seats next to them. Oh, yeah, we have people waiting for seats. IBM is making you sit down. Follow their direction. It's social. <laughs> Not a darn one of them moved. All right. There's seats everywhere for those people that are standing in the back. There is a bunch. They're scooting around for you. Victor needs three. All right. This is where we handle refunds and complaints. If you haven't seen the river, it's overflowing out front. Like I said, it's free. If you have something that you need to complain about, uh, make sure it's really good. All right, uh, we've addressed part of the Wi-Fi stuff already. If you have issues with that, let us know. If you have a VPN issue, tell us. We can get you to the right place. Uh, there's a special login if you're having VPN issues. But otherwise, everything should be good to go. While you're in here, there's Wi-Fi. For the first year in the theater, we're providing Wi-Fi. Uh, sponsored by Connectria, there's two access points. The password was on the uh, first screen. It's all social, lowercase. So the password is, it's all social. You'll see two Wi-Fi hotspots labeled Connectria sponsored Wi-Fi. They'll be here this morning and tonight for the party, because otherwise, the casino doesn't allow access on their network because of gaming regulations. While we're in the hotel, it's separate. But over here, we've got hotspots that are running for everybody, okay? iPads, everything else should be good to go. Our first keynote speaker. We're right on time. How'd that work, Lewis? We're, I talked faster, which is not possible. So our first one, Lewis Richardson, um, I had to bribe him. Uh, beg, cry, ask him, change your schedule. No, really, he volunteered. Uh, it's awesome to have him here, as you guys can see. One of the things I didn't know about him is the last one, Electronic Security Command, really? U.S. Air Force, really? I didn't know that. So I went through his LinkedIn profile back to, it was, what, what year was that? That was me that dug through your profile. What year was, what year was that? 78 to 82. So he's been doing this a long time. He speaks globally all over at user events, customers, everything else. We call him the whisperer. He doesn't know that. We just call him the whisperer. Uh, it's going to be the first part of the keynote. Then we have a second part, which I'll introduce as soon as Lewis is done. Uh, if you guys remember, when this is over at 1030, just in case I forget at the end, you'll have a half hour break to reorganize yourself, follow Julian to the coffee, and head on down to the sessions after that. So I'm going to bring up Lewis Richardson as the first keynote, and we'll see you guys in a few minutes. Yeah, get that off the screen. Yeah. So I'm glad at least one person looked at my LinkedIn profile. I love to know the audiences. These audiences change over time. So I'm going to ask a question, and it's going to, you're going to have two choices, because the technical audience always likes to know what are my choices before I make a decision. So the two choices are this. I'm a technical person. I probably spend my time. I write code. I actually know how to write code, OK? And I'm responsible for doing that. Or maybe I run an IT project. And then the other part is, the other choice is I'm a line of business person. That means, you know, I. I ask these people to write code for me, or I run HR or training or something like that. So those are your two choices. So technical people, please. All right, what I expected. OK, line of business, do we have any? Awesome, thank you. I expect you guys in my session later. Okay, I'm not a technical person. In fact, uh, watching this, you know, these 10 IBM champions and so forth in the room reminds me of my son when he was in high school. He came back from an important test. And I said, so son, how'd you do? And he said, well, dad, you know those, that top 10%? He said, I'm one of those people who make that possible. <laughs> All right, so I am not an IBM champion, um, but I appreciate the IBM champions. I don't know that I had to do anything about making them possible. But what I wanted to do was to spend a little bit of time this morning just discussing some ideas and some things that concern me. And I think they're concerned some of your managers, some of your executives in your organization. Um, to start off with, let's just do a little imagination thing. At IBM, we've got some really wicked smart people, okay? So imagine with me, we have these guys that are in biomedical engineering, and they have determined a way to actually implant a third eyeball on a body. So you can actually have a third eye. Imagine that, right? But our marketing people are a little concerned because they're not sure where they're going to advertise where that eyeball should be. So I want to do a little survey here. And please, this is a family audience, okay? Where would you put a third eyeball, if you had it, on your body? Where would you put that? Back of your, Back of your head. Your excellent answer, number one answer among adults. Okay, others, I see Victor. Where would you like yours, Victor? I, I know the answer. Okay, so anyone else? Anyone else? He was, he was in a session I did earlier. Anyone else have any other ideas other than the back of your head? Pardon? On the hand. Number one answer with kids. On the hand or on the end of the finger? Okay, why is that? Right? I've talked to kids about it. It's so I can see what's up on the table. Is that me? 
My massive presence is just thumping. Uh, I can look around the corner to see if mom's still awake so I can get up and watch TV, right? Um, I can't see the parade, right? That's, that's the important thing. By the way, I can see behind me. Now, how many of you who would want, and by the way, the back of the head, imagine, why was that? Why do you think that we've don't, done that, right? I, see what's behind me, right? Uh, I, I wish I had eyes in the back of my head. You know, people are talking behind my back. These are things that we've grown accustomed to that we as adults think of, you know, behind us. Now, for those of you who are thinking behind your head, how many now would say, the finger sounds like a pretty good idea? Raise your hands. Finger a pretty good idea? All right. So that kind of thing happens in our organizations. We're trained to do a certain thing, and yet sometimes if we get a little different perspective, we might change the idea because it might be a little better. We have a lot of crises that we're faced with, okay? We have a crisis of finance. We have a crisis of, excuse me, we have a crisis of energy. We have a crisis of food. Um, we have a crisis of, cue the music, environmental, okay? So with all these crises that we have, we think about trying to, trying to attack those. Many of you who are in business are trying to attack some of these maybe, okay? You've got some concerns here, but you know, if we, if we attack any one of these and focus on them, often we'll mess up the other ones. We've seen that happen. I'm gonna go after trying to fix the energy crisis, but in turn, I'm gonna mess up the environment. There actually is a crisis that I think that if we focus on, that we can actually address it and actually impact, positively impact all of these. And it's the creativity crisis. Right? So, you know, what is the creativity crisis? This is called, this is a boardroom. It's called that because we sit in them and we're bored, right? How many of you spend time in meetings just listening to the same old stuff over and over again, right? It's the same old drivel. We're doing it the same way we've always done it. How many of you actually, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you sit in meetings that are hours long only to get five or six minutes worth of good information, right? You spend, hopefully this time you're spending this morning you'll get a little more than that. But the point is, we don't have people challenging the status quo. We have people just doing the same old thing over and over again. We have people putting eyes in the back of our heads because that's what everyone else thinks we should do. And the challenge there is that we need to change this. We did a study, 2010 we did a study um, in which we asked the CEOs of companies, we said, what is it that you want most out of your leaders? What's the quality that you want in your leaders for the next five years? And in 2010, the CEOs told IBM, they said, we want our leaders to be creative. Among all other things, we want them to be creative. And I thought that was remarkable. So we came out with another study in 2012, the same group of people, the same, not the same group of people, but the same audience, CEOs across the world, and they told us this, for our people to be successful, they want, want them to be creative, they want them to be able to communicate really well, they need to be flexible, and they need to be collaborative in nature. But yet, Adobe did a study last year, and only one out of four of us believe that we're, creating, we're actually reaching our creative potential. I mean, if I were to ask the audience again, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but think about it. Are you really realizing your creative potential in the job that you have right now and the things that your office and your company and so forth are asking you to do? So you're, but the CEOs are saying, let's go do this. Let's all go be creative. Okay, let's go do that, right? That's what's coming up from above. So what does it mean to be creative? This is where you help me out. What are some of the words that come to your mind when I say creative? This is response time. Think out of the box. Think out of the box. That's good. Others? Were you all in the casinos last night? I mean, come on, <laughs> help me. What's freedom. freedom. That's actually a good one. Freedom, I like that. Assume that nothing's sacred. sacred. This guy's come up with two of them, and you guys have done nothing. You're not pulling your weight, all right? Innovator. An innovator, thank you. All right, I was with a group one time, and a guy raised his hand. He said, I think of the word messy. Messy? I said, I love the definition. I love that, but why does that? He said, well, I'm a compliance officer at a bank. So I can see creative banking is not really what we're shooting for here. But if I went into thesaurus and I just said, well, tell me the words that is commonly associated with creativity. Here's some of the words, okay? Clever, fertile, some of the things we talked about. Inventive, leading edge. What's interesting is this word on the bottom, okay? Productive. You know, it's interesting that creative, creativity and productivity are equated. But yet, back in that Adobe survey that they did, three out of four people said they were having pressure to be productive rather than creative. Most of us feel that being creative is not being productive. Being creative is something else. And I'll tell you, as a, as a person who does smarter workforce and social business evangelism around the world, when I talk to people about doing things around opening up, sharing ideas, uh, exploring things, a lot of people look at me and go, but that's not productivity. And in reality, it is. It's very productive. So what got us here? We're in this situation where 
Our companies want us to be creative, but yet we feel like we're not creative. We have managers who are trying to make us to be productive rather than creative. What got us here? Well, there's a few things, and I don't want to take a, make this a history lesson, but if we look back at our roots, I always look at, at, at cause and effect. And if I look at our roots, we look at the Industrial Revolution. And we think about how we've implemented this policy of job descriptions. I mean, I imagine most people in the room may have a job description, right? And your job description says this is what you're supposed to do. This is the job that you've been hired for. And how many of us have ever heard the excuse of, I'm sorry, I can't do that. That's not in my job description, right? That's sad, okay, that we say this is our job description. Um, you know, Chris mentioned that I was in the Air Force, okay? So I've been at 13 different companies before coming to IBM. I've done a variety of things from write code, don't ever ask me to do that, but from writing code all the way up to, you know, selling and so forth. The point is, that whole history, my job description right now says that this is what I'm supposed to do, but yet that whole history of mine is valuable to me and hopefully valuable to people that I consult with and I work with because I can think of things like I used to work with an insurance company, so I could talk to you a little bit about insurance, and that has value to you, right? So it's thinking outside your job description. Often that's what we need because we, what we try to do is we try to train people and organize them and put them in these little things that say this is efficient. And in reality, if you think about it, it's so that we can scale, okay? So we can, we can scale. We, if, you get, if you get messed up, I can replace you with another one just like you. And for those of us in the development environment, we've seen the cause and effect of that, right? Any educators in the room, people involved in education systems? A couple, okay? This is a passion of mine. Um, I think our education systems here in the U.S. are pretty whacked up. But one of the things about education, and Ken Robinson is one of the great speakers on this, by the way, is that we, are, we need to change this. We think about how we educate people. Now, this is education in schools. Actually, it bleeds into our organizations, too. Think about the education systems in your, in your organizations. Um, there's a, there's a, a standard of, I won't call it out-of-the-box thinking, that they actually can measure, okay? You can measure it and you can kind of tell who's at a genius level at this particular standard of this, this uh, kind of lateral thinking. And there was a study done where I think they took around two or 3,000 individuals and they tested them and at 98%, excuse me, there was a genius level, right? And so these 2,000 individuals that they tested, 98% of them tested genius, the ability to solve problems creatively. They were four and five-year-olds. All right. The great thing about the study is a linear study. Five years later, they tested the same kids, those same individuals, and the, it dropped from 98% down to like 52%. Another five years, it went down to like 30%. And they actually didn't keep the test long enough, but they went out and found adults that were similar in makeup and tested them. Less than 2% of them tested genius level. What happened? We educated them. All right? We educated them. We told them, here's a problem, and by the way, here's the solution. We know the problem well enough that we've already defined the solution. All you have to do is remember the solution, right? And by the way, there's one answer. It's in the back of the book, and you can't look. So don't go look in the back of the book. And by the way, don't work with your people around you, the students around you. What do we call that in business? That's called collaboration, right? But yet we teach our kids. That's not the way, we that's not the way you learn. The way you learn is just this memory thing. So don't get me, I'm sorry, don't get me started. I've got to keep moving. Success. I mean, we're in companies that are in business today, right? Um, I was at breakfast this morning with a bank, uh, some people from a bank. They've been in business a long time. IBM's in business for a long time. Often this whole idea of success is if it's working, don't mess with it, right? We've been here for a long time. There's a guy named Guy Kawasaki who wrote a book, and in his book he talks about how in one, at one time there was, a, there was a, 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 the, the need to actually harvest ice. I'm looking around the room. I don't think any of us remember that, right? I have to be careful when I start talking about age things, about who I'm looking at, because people say, you kept looking at me every time I talked about age stuff, right? <laughs> so forgive me. All right, so the harvest ice. So these guys would cut ice out of the lakes, the frozen lakes. They'd put it in, in uh, wagons, take it into town where people could use it. Well, then along came these ice houses. They said, well, these guys said, well, I can just cool the ice down in town. I can freeze it. I can have these ice houses serve up ice to locally, you know, to... And then all of a sudden people said, you know, I can actually take that refrigeration thing, that freezer thing, and put it in my home. And I have home refrigeration. I can actually create ice for myself in the house. Interestingly enough, none of the companies who were ice harvesters became ice houses. And none of the companies that were ice houses became home refrigeration companies. Why? Because these guys over here were all concerned about better saws and better wagons, right? They were focused on their success. We're very successful, and they missed the next part. And I'll tell you that we IBM are one that we have to keep looking at, as, as successful as we are, we have to keep looking at what's the next thing. If, you, if your company is not thinking about what is it, where they're going to be in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, you need to think about that. That's some of the creativity that you need in your organization to help you with that. 
Pardon? Yep. Fear of failure. When's the last time your boss got you in for a pep talk and said, okay, folks, here's my job for you today. Go out and do something, and I don't care if you fail. Just go, go do something and fail, right? Go give it a try. I mean, think about how often we avoid mistakes and avoid failure. Somebody was telling me this morning, in fact, uh, Kurt, uh, the, the guy who's going to be speaking after me, we were talking about Midwestern culture, and he was saying how people sometimes stigmatize mistakes to the point of if you fail once, you're a failure for life. There was a, a gentleman on one of the recent TED Talks, he was a military commander, and he said the great thing about good leaders is that they allow you to fail, but they don't allow you to be a failure. I was with a, a comp, uh, school, and it was with uh, an all-girls school. And their senior class, every year, they sent them out on mission. They said, we want all of our senior girls to go off and try something that they're probably going to fail at. We encourage them, go try to rebuild a motor, go try to jump out of an airplane, go try to you know, build um, an aqueduct across your backyard. I mean, do something that's you know, kind of bizarre, right? And at the end of the week, they bring these girls back in and they ask them, so how'd you do? And, and the failure rate is so high because they're trying things that are just absolutely out of their control and they don't really help them try to solve the problem, they let them solve it for themselves. And they said what that actually happens is these, these young women graduate from school knowing that it's okay to fail because look at all the stuff we learned. Look at all the things that we know. Thomas Edison, I think, is known for saying, um, I fail more often than most, right? And some of those failures I patent. <laughs> think, about, think about your failures. Think about what you learn from your failures, okay? So how do we address it? What are we going to do in our companies? What are we going to do in our organizations? What are you going to do personally to try to address this? Well, the first thing is I say we have to avoid what, we call the, what I call the God complex. I don't call it. Tim Hartford actually coined the phrase God complex. Right. It's this thought that the problems that are out there are something that I can actually grasp every aspect of the problem. I know it, it you know, well, well, better than anyone else, better than God, and I can actually know what the answer is. That's impossible these days, okay? There's too many variables. There's, we're talking about a global scale in most cases. We're talking about cultures that maybe we're having to deal with that we don't know anything about. And we're talking about individuals. I mean, think of us. How many of us have, you know, how many of you guys have kids that are teenagers and you go, I, I don't get these people, right? I don't understand this. Guess what? They're the ones who are going to be buying our products in 10 years. So it's about time that we kind of open up and we, we have to recognize we don't understand this. So let's look, the, let's look the, up how we can actually um, change this. Consider where work gets done. This guy, Jason Fried, um, I watched his TED Talk and I ended up buying his book and reading it. Great book, by the way, but his talk is awesome. And I'll steal a little bit from him. But first of all, he says that in, the, in his uh, 10 years or so, he's been evaluating people. In fact, I'll ask you guys his question. Where do you get your best work done? If you had a piece of work that was really important, you really needed to, to do it well, where would that work be done? Where would you do that? A place, a time, what, when? Help me. What's that? Your home office? Who else? Early in the morning? Starbucks. I love Starbucks. I spend a lot of time at Starbucks. Free Wi-Fi is great. Others? My office. Your office. My office at IBM. Your office at IBM. Thank you. Well, okay, he's, here's an IBMer. He's a plant. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave. I love my building. Okay. His point is that often we, we think of our work time, and, we, and when he asks this question of people, they usually come up with a couple of things. First of all, it's usually a place. It's like in my attic or in the shower or, you know, on, or in a mode of transportation. It's on the bus on the way to work or in the train or in my car. Um, the, the fact that most often in your office, in your office building, if you go to a building, um, normally your day starts at 8 in the morning or 9 in the morning and goes to 5 o'clock at night. And that time is just a series of interruptions. Okay? Your day is just slices of things, right? And if you want to get really good work done, you need to have some time. You need to spend some time, some quality time. You know, you want to just shut the door. But guess what? When you shut the door, people knock on it. And even, even in IBM, okay, if I leave same time on, people are going to come to me, right? But I just change my same time status, drop off the same time. I spend time. There's a John Cleese YouTube. In fact, I'll go to the next one. It's the idea of using open and closed modes, right? It's the idea of saying, I, know, I need to be creative. I need to actually think about where work gets done, and I'm actually going to do my work in my home office or in this little area, and I'm going to do it at this time of day, and no one's going to interrupt me, right? I'm actually going to, sp going to spend a particular amount of time thinking about something, but then I'm going to come out and I'm actually going to do something with that. Um, his, um, 
And Police's YouTube is awesome. You need to look at I'm just, you guys are probably online now looking this up stuff, watching this. So if any of you are laughing later on, I'll know what you're talking, what you're doing. And connect. Okay? Open conversations. All right? This, this survey I did earlier about the eyeball, right? The guys that said, I like the back of my head or whatever. And then all of a sudden someone pops up and says, maybe my finger, maybe my hand. That connection takes place. By the way, you don't know who those people are in your organization. You need to kind of keep a, a broad perspective of things. Enlist the help of people on the fringe. Enlist the help of people who may not be. Now think, think about all the projects that happen. And by the way, the God complex causes this a bit. Someone will say, I, I need something done, so I'm going to get you. You're an administrator. You know about this topic. I'm going to put you in. And you're a developer, and you know about this thing. I'm going to put you in. And all of a sudden, we gather all these people together who think alike. And then we expect something amazing to happen. All right? At best, we're going to get something installed and delivered and maybe put out there. But the question is, is that really going to help your organization? How many times have you installed something, installed even our latest products, and the customers go, so what? Right? Get their opinion. Get their, get their questions. I was, again, with a, with a customer. I'm not going to name the customer. But recently, with a customer, and we had a, a passionate user in the meeting. And he was very vocal about what he liked and what he didn't like. And he voiced problems and concerns that the administrator of the system sitting across the table said, I know the answer to that question. I know how to solve this problem. Here, this guy's been frustrated for some period of time. He's, he's laboring and, and thinking, he probably thinking, well, gee, notes isn't what I want to use or whatever. And here it is. He's just got a simple question I can answer. I just wish I knew his an he had the question. Connect. It's amazing not only what you can help people with, but also what, what help they can be to you. And quickly, I'll just, uh, there's a lot of good sessions during the week here, um, during the two days here. It may seem like a week by the time you're over. But these two days here that you can actually learn more about products. I'm not going to talk too much about products, but the idea is if you, if you want to do things like connect, there are products and, and there's tools, social tools that help you do that. Um, you know, connect with people through their profile. If you have notes, for instance, do you know you're entitled to profiles and files as part of your entitlement of notes? You can actually install connections, profiles, and files and run it for free. And that will allow everyone to have a profile. I can't tell you how important just that one piece is to an organization, to be able to find people. Now, you look at that and go, well, that's a nice corporate directory. Sure, I can find people. I can call them up. I can see who their boss is. I can see who their manager is. But more importantly, I, as an individual, can list, hey, I used to work in an insurance company. I used to work in this, uh, in this particular area. I know these types of information. I tag myself. It becomes very beneficial for people to find expertise not just find you to ask you questions so that you can do their work for them, which most people go, I don't want people coming to me. I've got enough work already. But the idea is now you, if you can actually reach out to people. Social bookmarks. Many of us will find things that, you know, the, the web is incredible. I don't know if any of us in the room actually work for companies where they block the intranet, or internet, I should say. Um, but, there, you know, when you're out on the internet and you're looking at a TED Talk, this happened to be a TED Talk I found, and I thought, this is brilliant, I should share this. But instead of taking the URL and just putting it in an email and sending it to people or whatever, I can socially bookmark it. I can just say, hey guys, anyone who's following me, anyone in my organization, in fact, I can actually send it to, like, the CIO Innovation Office. I said, I want it to go to them. So it goes to their community where people can see it, and they're not bothered with an email. Avoid this God complex. You've got to have the conversation bigger than yourself, okay? So use things like blogs and wikis, right? Within IBM, one of the things I love about IBM is that when someone has an idea, we post things. In fact, a lady tells me, she said, I love working for IBM because I can be as smart as you only five minutes later. Right? Because it's our culture that if you find something that's interesting, if you find something that's valuable, you post it. And if people want it, they can get to it. But they're not being, it's not being pushed in front of them. It's just saying, here, this is now available to you for you to, for you to find it. It's interesting how often I will look for something. I'll find it in a blog. I'll look to find who the author is, which takes me to their profile. From their profile, I'll find other works that they've done that's even equally important or even more important to what I'm looking for. Forums, you guys are probably well familiar with how to do questions and answers in forums. Ideation blogs is something that we do at IBM around... Uh, you know, taking topics and putting it out there for people to put their ideas up so that people can actually say, I like this idea, I can vote on it. And the idea of using open and closed modes. I'm, I'm working, I need to focus, I need to be left alone. You can do things like status updates. Status updates are great because you can just post to your group, this is what I'm doing. I just came back uh, a week ago, I took a week off of vacation, something I rarely do, but my wife 
It was our 35th wedding anniversary, and she demanded that if I was going to be 36, I was going to take a week of vacation. So I took a week of vacation, and it was an enjoyable time with my family. But before I left, I put in my out-of-office email notification. Dear soul, if you're receiving this, um, be, please be aware that when I come back, I'm not going to read your email. I, if you have something important, post it on my board, on my profile board. And by the way, when I come back, I'll just ask my profile board. I'll go to my profile board and say, hey, guys, did I miss anything? And the important stuff will come back up. And I did that. It was beautiful. Just absolutely gorgeous. And by the way, every day my inbox is empty. Okay? We have conversations within our organization and within our group in which we say, if we're going to have a talk about something, let's look at a status update. For somebody pinged me the other day and asked me a question. I said, that's a question for Luis Suarez, okay? He's a guy that's now running our W3, our inside of our, our firewall connections. I said, that's a great question for him. Post it on his board. He did. Within minutes, Luis had, question, had answered it, and the guy following the question actually would just, they had the conversation in the open, okay? If you have something that's incredible, put it where people can get to it. Okay, here's a question. You're in a company. Think about your company right now. I'm a hot to trot, new employee, I just came out of college, you know, top of my class, your talent management system was able to gap, capture me and I'm coming to work for you, right? And let's say I'm in the engineering group and I, I actually come you know, with this great degree from engineering, I have this white paper on the use of uh, structural engineering and whatever it is that we're doing and I think it's a brilliant piece of work, it's a, it's a nice white paper, it's in a, in a document, electronic document. I come to you as my manager and say, where can I put this in our organization where everybody can get to it? Where are you going to tell me to put it, right? Excuse me, don't say that literally. But the idea is most people, if you ask them that question, they'll say, well, that kind of depends. What is it? Well, it's this document. Well, let's put it over here in this site, or let's put this in this little team room, or let's, let's put it over here. And basically, you're by, by definition, you're saying, you, I think this work is good for this type of person, so I'm going to put it over here where those people are. And guess what? There's people on the fringe who never have an access to it, or we won't even know that it's there. The great thing about using connections and using things like social files is I can actually just post stuff. I rarely get questions anymore about, Lewis, do you have that latest presentation? Or, Lewis, do you have that sales forecast that you owe me? Or, Lewis, do you have... Guess what? They just go to my files and get it. My email is basically has dropped down to where, as I, as I said, I can get rid of all my email every day. And work gets done in, not only in different places, but in different ways. A manufacturing company we were working with said, we have people on the shop floor who do not use computers. We manufacture things. We have a manufacturing floor. They have a little kiosk where they can put in things for orders and back orders and stuff, but it's really not a place where they're going to be social. But yet these people have been doing this for years and years, and I'm sure they've got some great ideas. So how do we get them to capture their great ideas? Most all those people had a smartphone. And they said, just videotape the best practice. If you have a better way of putting that widget on that device, just have somebody videotape you doing it, talking through that, post it to the social network. Our policies and procedures people will take a look at it, see if that's the better way to do that. Then maybe they'll make it a policy. So everybody does that, right? But you've got to think about how people communicate. And mobility, obviously, is a huge thing. I know we've got some great sessions in the next couple of days on mobility. And I was talking to someone at breakfast. They said, that's my focus. I'm here to talk about mobility. I mean, I don't like working all hours of the day, but I sure love the fact that when I'm in a taxi heading to the airport, I can clean stuff up, right? I can just get that nuisance stuff out of my way and just tell people to bug off or whatever it is, right? But I can do that quickly, and then when I can go to my work, I can actually do my work. Having people, you know, people say, well, mobility is a bad thing because I don't want to be having to do work at a soccer game, okay? I love our mobility solutions because I don't have to do work at a soccer game, right? My work gets done during the day, but mobility allows me to actually access it where I need it, when I need it. So what does it mean to you, right? It means in your organizations you're going to have to change a bit. You have to go from this organization to more of an organism. And I think about, I think about this already. I think we're moving to that a little bit because how many of you, I'm not going to, again, no raise of hands. But think about how many people in your organization have a dotted line report, right? Your org chart looks like this, but yet I dotted line over to this other person. We're already starting to realize that there's an organism approach to this. We have to think now about the fact of who people report to. I report to a gentleman who I talk to maybe twice a month, okay? But, but my job is basically to serve you guys and to serve business partners and to serve other, other salespeople. That's my job. So it's important that that's my organism. That's who I'm working for. 
And it's more about, instead of transactions, it's more about relationships. Think about email. Email is a pretty good transactional communication system, right? It always has been, it always will be. It's a great one to do that. But it's really hard to carry on long-term relationships just using email. It's very good often to carry on conversations. If you start them in email, you can actually move them to a social network and reuse email. I'm not the one that's going to say that email is dead. I don't think email is dead. But I think the way we abuse it sometimes is a little um, out of character. And that would take 20 minutes for me to discuss, so I'm not going to do that. So if you need help, um, you know, this is the, this, I, I work for IBM. And so you need the slide, right? This is that, the one slide that's in the box, all right? But um, one of the things I, I, I appreciate is that for the fourth year now, IBM's been identified as the leader in social business, and we're often the unknown leader. And so within your organization, if you go to your boss and you say, look, uh, I'd like to, I think we need to think about this uh, whole idea of, of social business or this smarter workforce area, and, and I'd like to bring in IBM, and they look at you with a kind of an odd face, you know, remember, you can say, hey, guys, you know, check out the, the IDC report. You know, they do say that they're the number one. Uh, so maybe that'll help us get in the door and get people convinced that IBM actually knows something about this. And we've been doing it. We've been doing it for decades. And by the way, I want to thank you guys, all right? Um, again, this uh, whole social thing, this whole s s way to work smart, none of that is new. Think about the projects that you've been doing in notes for years and years. You've been sharing files, you've been helping people communicate to one another, you've been helping people get together and share information, you're trying to make transactional information, very, it's like you've been doing this for years. And I, think, I appreciate you guys being pioneers in this because you make my job a lot easier. And, and notes is a tremendous part of that now, as well as this whole social piece. So again, help us out. And those of you who are here says, yeah, I get it, but you don't know my boss. Right? That's just not going to fly in my organization. All right? This is where I think we can help. First of all, there's a, a lot of good information that you can go out and, and, and connect. Connect, for instance, connect with us at, at our websites. Okay? So there's a lot of things that you can pull from. There's things like our governance policies, and if people want to feel more comfortable about this wild, wild west of social and how it might get out of control, we've actually got some great governance policies you can look at. But more than that, connect with me, okay? I'm here at your service. I'm, one of my, my roles as an uh, evangelist storyteller kind of guy is that if you say, look, I don't think my boss will get it, or if you say, I'm having difficulty convincing my boss, or we've got a group of people in our organization I'd love to have you come talk to, I'd be more than happy to do that, okay? So work through a business partner, work through your IBM rep, work through however, work, come to me directly, okay, and ask. I'd be more than happy to help you guys do this. I'm going to be here uh, for most of the day. I've got a session later on this afternoon that, again, if you're a technical person, I would highly recommend that you don't come. All right, because there's some great technical. I'm, a, I'm off, offside of a couple of technical sessions that I just think are awesome. In fact, by the way, have you guys looked at the titles of some of these sessions? We're getting a little on the edge, guys, okay? Just look at some of the sessions sometime and think about an outsider, somebody who doesn't understand this, looking at some of these session names. Don't roll your own. <laughs> um, your auth is open. I mean, come on, where's that one from? Oh, sorry, but anyway, um, I was looking at sessions. There's some great sessions that are opposite mine, uh, so I'd appreciate it if you guys, this is your time, your effort, you, you can spend it where you'd like, but if you'd like to, to involve me sometime, great. And also, as I said, I'm here, so if you want to pull me aside sometime, that's fine as well. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Chris. Well, that was quick. All right, no, I'm kidding. We're on time. Excellent, you guys. I want to thank Lewis very much for coming through because I know he's busy and he does stuff. I, stuff. I don't know. I've watched him four times in four different countries now, and I still say stuff because I'm not really sure what that stuff is yet, but that's good. No. A um, lot of good stuff. He does have an excellent session that's going to be going on, and it's later today, right? We said it later today. And then you're out of here. So if you need to talk to him for anything, today's the day. So at lunch, just swarm Lewis. Do everything you can do to just overwhelm him with social. All right? I want him to feel well want. So, special thing. So, a lot of you know I do a lot around the social media space outside of the normal work stuff. Uh, a little too much sometimes, some of you think. And I ran across this guy at an event a while ago. And we started talking about what everybody did. And, you know, they asked what I do, and no one still understands. Even my own father, who showed up for this event, doesn't know what I do still. So, what we ended up talking about was a company that he started. And 
as I was driving into work, I don't know, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I said, he should be here as part of the keynote. Why? Because it's another aspect about building applications, building UI, as well as social aspect of the whole thing without beating you guys to death about social, of course. But the, what you guys are, developers, administrators, running social, user adoption, user experience, user interface. So it's called Zipline. Uh, he'll explain everything about what it is, but they're founded here in St. Louis. He can give you the details of how long and everything else. Uh, but I really wanted to talk to you guys. And then tomorrow, he's doing a session on building privacy policies for your company. So think about, you, how many of you have an email usage policy? Yeah, how many of you have updated that in over 10 years? Yeah, well, you're your own employee, so it doesn't really matter. But the rest of you that have companies, big ones, you really don't update those much, right? Internet usage, email usage, they stick the same. Well, now we're getting into social usage. What information could be shared? What about my networks? Things like that. So he's going to do a session tomorrow that's going to handle a lot about privacy policies and social interaction. But from there, I'm going to let you explain the rest of who you are. All right, but everybody, welcome Kirk Bowman. So, founder of Zip, co founder of Zipline. Awesome. Thank you. Which book? Uh, Sounds good. Left and right. Yep. You cool. You got a Great. Demo. I don't think I'm on. Is this on? Okay, good. Thanks for having me, Chris. I got a few cheat sheets here I'll display. Um, like he said, we're, we're zipline. So we are, th this is, the, you're getting the spectrum this morning, the spectrum of very, very large company, social business, and, you know, the other end of the spectrum is local, six and six full-timers and two part-timers that come to work every day to develop a tech startup. A couple of um, the guys that are key to our team over here, our executives, uh, Kung Dang does all of our user experience, and Ian Robinson is our uh, chief software architect, and, and uh, they came to heckle me today, I think. They said they were just gonna, they were just gonna heckle me. So a, a lot of the things that we do at Zipline, I learned from these guys as we've iterated through this process. But I'll start with this because our application, and we'll get a little bit deeper into it if, in a conversation, I, d I don't want to just talk about us, but we wanted to come up with this idea of social pay, a payment system that is a lot less system and a lot more human. And what would that look like? Because payment has come very tr become very transactional and it has become very kind of detached from any kind of communication experience. So. Um, we start. We, we start. We spent a lot of time thinking about what we wanted to be before we built the product. And I'll say this: whenever the Facebook movie came out a few years ago, I was kind of disappointed in the title because I'd read the book, and the book is called *The Accidental Billionaires*. And I know that's not a real sexy movie title, but. They called it the social network. And what it did, I think, is it kind of put in all of our minds or it like put out in the social consciousness this idea that social networks were invented at Harvard in 2004 by a couple of guys in a dorm and that there's never been a social network before that. These guys built the social network and we all know that's not true. Social business, uh, Lewis just said, social business has been around for years and years and years, even before computers. You know, this, you know, this is old school social business, you know, a suggestion box in your restaurant. That's, that's social business. You know, people wanted, business owners wanted feedback, people wanted to do things and, and they, they and, and computers have given us the ability to expand and scale those things that we already do. But one of the problems as social is become, being defined is that if we were to, I won't make you do this, but if we were to like divide this room into a bunch of groups of 10 and said, what is your definition of social? What is the definition of social? I think what we would find is we'd find that there are, we'd get a diversity of answers back. Um, diversity is not always bad, but one of the things that can occur when too many inputs are coming into the same person, or too many inputs, this is social, this is social, I was reading, a, I was reading on a blog that this is social, somebody tweeted that this is the new definition of social, and the next thing you do is you, you start letting others define what it is for you, and then when others define what it is for you, then you make the mistake of just taking those things and rolling them into the project you're doing, without really giving foresight as to what's going on. I'll give you an example. How many times have you looked at somebody's application or some app online and you're like, why in the world would I want to tweet this? Why would I want to do, why, why would this go on Twitter? Sometimes people just like, hey, you can socially share. It's real easy to add to my application. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And it's like, hey, dude, I just, just tweeted something that you're like, it doesn't really make sense to tweet it. Um, 
Money transfer, for instance, is a social interaction, but it's usually a social interaction that's much more intimate than I hand my friend Dang $20 and then I turn to the room and say, hey, I just paid Dang $20 because I you know, owed him for a, a bratwurst at the Cardinal game. That's not a normal human behavior. Now, I might want to do that. I might want to say, hey, I just reimbursed him for concert tickets and we're going to go see Kiss. Come, come with us next year, whatever that is. And that, that can become social, so it gives us, gives us different options. But what we don't want to do is we don't want others to define what that means while you're developing your application. Same thing for open source communities. You'll see somebody contribute some module or something to an open source community and they'll say, oh yeah, it's a social module. I'm just gonna snap it on here to what I'm doing and now I've got a social version of my application. Big mistake because there's not a lot of foresight. Think back to that example of Facebook. Was Mark Zuckerberg, were his friends trying to create the world's largest social network when they sat down to write Facebook? Not really, not at all. That's why the book is called The Accidental Billionaires. The re what they were doing is they were trying to meet girls and hook up. <laughs> it's very human. What we do, if we can break down what we're trying to do to the most human intuitive level, you'll find that the socialness kind of comes out. You know, like, like I said, adding Twitter to an app basically makes your app narcissistic and you're a narcissistic stalker with ADHD. Don't, don't do this just because you can. It's not a good, good thing to do. So think about our basic humanity. Think about that example of Mark Zuckerberg. I'm just, I just wanna, uh, we wanna meet girls and we would like to hook up. Think about your life and mine. At any given time, we're doing, bas we're basically in one of three silos in our life. We're with friends and family, we're pursuing our work, or we're in pursuit of our hobbies and interests. This is our silos while we're awake. And then another thing, when you look at the actions of your life, what are people wired to do? Well, we're wired to communicate, and we're wired to move. We're a mobile people. So where do you think, if these are very basics about us, where do you think all of the explosive viral social networks are? They're in these places. It makes sense that our most basic humanity is really what social means. So when you look at your application and you put your, you know, you're going to say, okay, I want to develop this or I'm an administrator and my company needs one of these. I'm going to hire a team or I'm going to bring over a team from this department to do it. Think not about, you know, what do I want? What features do I want? But think about what do people do at a human level with what we're trying to accomplish. And so I would say, we would say around the office, and, and you can word this a lot of different ways, I'm gonna give you kind of three things to think about, just kind of three takeaways, if you will, of things that you should do or questions you should ask, or in, in the case of this title, choices you should make when thinking about doing social development within any kind of computer application or any office design. And the first thing is to choose the correct lens, and I'll tell you what I think that means. My son is nine years old, and if he were given a choice to choose which lens he would want on the camera, he'd choose the big one. You know, it's sexier, it's a bigger lens. And I call that the features lens. And what we, what we tend to do, what's easy to do, what makes sense to do, because we want to be in a hurry, is to say, let's lay out all of these possible features we can do, and it becomes this nice big smorgasbord, you know, you go through the smorgasbord, and that jiggly jello when you're a kid looks pretty good until you get it once, and it's not really that good, and it's not a good way to build a meal, it's, and, and, and going with features is not a great way to build any kind of application. What, I, what we would say is, if you're going to be social, you've got to look at the community. You've got to choose the community lens when you're looking at and you're studying what you need to do. The study shouldn't 
come in, uh, the, the, the idea of the tools or the features shouldn't really come into play. You know, if, uh, to, I, I, we always say tools are never a strategy. You know, the strategy should, should be developed around listening, learning, defining, measuring, prioritizing, developing all of these things. None of these things are tools. This is, this is more, of a, more of a way to develop a strategy. The tools come after the strategy. So, so um, we, um, when we give some examples of how that is, we, we, if you're in a large organization, even a medium-sized organization, one of the things we deal with, small company, small little application, we also have to pay attention to sub-communities. And, and, and um, one, one, we, we like to do sometimes one-size-fits-all solutions. Hey, this thing works. And so it works. But you think about a lot of organizations. Your, your development team at your, at your company, even at our company, we've, we've got six people on our development team, five or six, a few contractors that work for us from time to time. And they segment on different projects. The development team might look a little bit like this. But your administrative uh, layer at your company, your administrative focus may be more like a lot of people with a lot of different titles, but it's fairly horizontal. And then you go to a different department of sales and you've got hierarchical, uh, arch you know, hierarchical structure. Sales manager, regional managers, sales reps, things like that. How could one communication tool or one social tool fit all of those things? They don't. So there, there needs to be some adaptability within what you're doing to fit the community. So not only study the communities, but study where the sub-communities are within the community and see what kind of tools they want. I, I'm an attorney by education, and there were many times I was sitting at my desk, needed to make a key decision on a, something of the client, and my way to socially network, my way to gather, my way to kind of reduce risk, which is why we, which is why we use social tools a lot, was to get up and walk down the hall and go seek out the two or three other attorneys in my office who would guide me in the right direction or at least affirm or you know, uh, confirm what I was thinking. Um, now I have the ability, I haven't practiced law for 15 years now, now I have the ability to post something on a message board and get 400 opinions if I wanted. But is that really going to make a better decision for me sitting at my desk? So. Um, you know, we have to discriminate between those two things. Most of the time, the three attorneys down the hall, that's the best solution. It's still the best solution, and it has nothing to do with a computer. Every once in a while, when, no, when we're really perplexed, we go out to the message board and say, hey, community, what, uh, what's the best thing to do here? And, and, and we could get some help. And you guys can think of, think of a lot of examples like that. But think about the different sub-communities within your office. Zipline, for instance. We've got three basic communities in our application. There's the one that you think of as most basic. I need to pay somebody $20. I've got my phone, they've got their phone, they've got a bank account. I move $20. Uh, one of the things that, that people love about using our application is we don't charge anything. So when I send $20, you get $20. It moves it from my bank to yours just by the touch of a phone. That, but, but you think about that, that's two people. That is a nano community. We're a community for a few minutes right when that happens, one and the other person. Doesn't sound like a community, but that is. That's a community we need to address, just those two people in that moment um, sending my sister money because she bought my mom something for uh, a birthday, my mom's birthday coming up. Another community within our zipline application is organizations. What does a business want to do? What kind of, you know, and, and, and all organizations are completely different. I, the, the guy that comes over and uh, mows my lawn, um, thank goodness he got in between all the rainstorms, you know. I, I pay him babysitters, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that sounds silly, but that's a business. Everything up to um, our office is right next door to a restaurant, and we have a guy over there that, you know, he knows some of his customers, he, he, some of his customers he doesn't know. What kind of things does he want to do in the interaction of that transaction? Does he want to involve his whole, does he consider all of his customers a community, or does that business owner uh, that owns my wife's hair salon, does she think, oh, um, you know, I just want this interaction with this person. So that organizations may look different. And then there are groups. We've got a, 
uh, we, we spend a lot of time on this. This is something we're really proud of because it's something that card companies and banks can't do. You walk into a bank and you say, I want to open a new account, and they say, is this an individual account or is this a business account? But we find that as humans, um, my Cub Scout troop really has a clumsy way of collecting money for the Pinewood Derby or my you know, softball team, when we each owe $22.50 for an upcoming tournament, it's really, uh, you know, my wife has a little book club. She's like, oh gosh, the part I hate about it is collecting $11 from 13 different people in my book club. It's, it, it's hard to do. So you've usually got a group leader and then a group, but that group does want to talk with each other whenever somebody, when we say, okay, here's what now we're doing for the tournament coming up this week, and somebody responds, hey, who's driving? Are we wearing the white uniforms or the dark uniforms? When will we know if it's going to be rained out? What number should we call? And those kind of things you want everybody to know versus this kind of situation where it's just customer to business. So we pay attention, and you should too, to the subgroups. Another part, uh, another good choice, and this is, this is um, what we'd say is choose the correct process. Uh, Lewis uh, hit on this a little bit earlier, and I'll, I'll kind of expand on it in, in our own way. And that is this. We've got this process. Nobody would disagree with this. You've got to study your problem first. You can't just go into it and start writing code. Or you can't go into it and just say, okay, let's wireframe this tomorrow now that we need this. You've got to study and study those communities that we were just talking about earlier. And then you get all the smart people together. And you put the smart people in a room and you say, now we're going to determine after study and with all of our knowledge what we need. And then once we've studied and we've determined, now we're going to ship this thing. And we're going to deploy it in our company and it's just going to be like pouring awesome sauce all over the company. It's just going to work great. And that, have you ever had that not happen? Have you ever seen that not happen? The, the awesome sauce is not so awesome? Um, one thing that organizations can learn from tech startups like us is that you should kind of flip these a little bit because the determining part is part of that God complex. Our study plus our brilliance should let us determine exactly what this thing should look like and then we'll build it and implement it. And that was, I don't want to pick on them, it's kind of the old Microsoft model. We're going to figure out what you want to do, what the next version of Word is, and here it is, now use it and love it. And of course you had to do that with the hardware structure and the software structure back then. But there's this thing that, you know, Lewis was also talking about, about failure, woven in, metab metabolized, whoops, metabolized into the culture in the, San Fran, in the Bay Area, is this idea of failing your way to success. We were just recently watching a video by the two guys that started Instagram. They went back to Stanford to talk to one of their classes and they said, how many of you know of Instagram? And everybody raised their hand. And the second question was, how many of you know of a company called Bourbon? And I think one girl, and, and he was like, uh, thank you, uh, we really appreciate that. Like, that's where their company started with this project called Bourbon. And it was horrible, they admitted it. They're like, we couldn't, Beyond our small group of friends, we couldn't explain to people what this thing did. We, we studied, we determined, and we shipped this thing that was clunky and nobody got it. And when we were getting ready to shut it down, we looked at our analytics and said, well, one thing people do is they filter these photos and share them. And they're like, let's just do that. Let's just see what happens if we do that. And they spent something like 60,000 more dollars. And it was Instagram and, and kind of an overnight sensation. So they, uh, they would say that think about, even in a company, like, uh, and not even inside of a company, think about going and making that proposal. Sometimes we want to say, okay, we're, we're going to charge a consulting fee to do some study for you. Then we're going to get in and determine what you want and write up this big statement of work. And then we're going to deliver this thing from the statement of work. And then we're done. And um, maybe a different approach, a way to approach that project is to go to somebody and say, we're going to study it, and then let us start building it. And let's determine as we get feedback from this internal community or this external community, 
how it will work, and, it, and it's a, it, it'll be a new way uh, to, to or a new way of thinking rather than the other way. And then the third thing I would say is uh, choosing the correct focus. And I said earlier this human focus, um, it's a, as opposed to a tool focus, or, or and, and no, no pun on the word being a tool, but, but don't focus on features and tools as much as what is the basic humanity? What would people be doing with this product? What would people be doing in this office if there was no technology? What, you know, how can we scale the suggestion box? Things of that nature. There are a lot of things that humans like about each other, and there are a lot of things they don't like about each other. I'm going to put three up here, but these are three of probably many that you could discuss in, in, in this process. One of those things is, I would say, you've got to be respectful with your social stuff. Um, yeah, I, I like that idea. Um, when you, um, just like I said earlier, this idea of, uh, and, and, and here's an example of where to think about. Think about when you're, in your, when you're building software, your default settings. Do, do your default settings all of a sudden do things that are disrespectful to the person using it? Um, I remember about a month, oh, there was about a month, uh, probably a year ago, for about a month, I kept seeing these things pop up on my Facebook wall about a Yahoo social reader. So-and-so read an article on how to get six-pack abs on social reader, and it'd be my mother-in-law. And it'd be like, my mother-in-law's not reading about how to get six-pack abs on Yahoo social reader. And what I found out is that when you just, when you click on it, it just, it throws it on your wall without asking. That lasted about a month because it was so disrespectful, it was like the anti-social reader. It was, you know, it was like, oh, I, and I'll never click on. As a matter of fact, there, there are a couple articles I saw, there were people, if they were interested in reading it, they would just flip over to Google and Google it and read the article, but they wouldn't dare click on it on their Facebook wall because it was a disrespectful way of being done. So. So when you, when you say, okay, I'm going to write this application, it's got some things that it's going to do here, and then it's going to have some social sharing, uh, a respectful way to do social sharing is to ask the user, would you like to put this on Twitter? Would you like to put this on Facebook? Would you like your community to know? And you see that, and, and, and social has gotten a lot more respectful, but, but keep in mind you know, ways within your community, within your study of being respectful. Another thing is just to be useful. Um, sometimes we get so caught up in the technology, sometimes we get so caught up in the method of what we're doing that we don't ask, is this really useful? Uh, uh, Kung Dang was telling me uh, a year or so ago that Apple is shocked at how they thought that FaceTime, uh, FaceTime on the iPhone was going to revolutionize how we call on phones. And FaceTime is actually, you know, we use it, but it's basically kind of a thud compared to what they thought it was going to be. It was not as useful as, as we thought. Um, we look back at, uh, there, there's a great book, uh, if you get a chance to read it, called Dude, Where's My Jetpack? And um, it talks about kind of, oh, the, the future studies and the people that say, okay, what you know, what are the things, when we look back at the 60s and 70s and 80s and you look at movies and read books about the future, what are the things that they got right and what are the things that they got wrong and why? And what we find is that the things that they got wrong were things that were like, oh, this will be really cool. We'll be able to get someplace with a jetpack without thinking, is that really useful? Uh, you know, is that really much more useful than a car? What we find is that people gravitate toward things that let them be more human like being connected in networks and smartphones and things of that nature really resonate more than the things that just were cool. Another thing is just being intuitive. Um, you know, you gotta put a good uh, Gene Wilder meme in, in every presentation, but, but intuition is, um, one of the things that I love about working with, with these guys is that um, we, we create, we're able to create processes where you shouldn't have to write a manual on how to use it. It should be intuitive. And until you get it there, until you get it, it, it the, the project shouldn't be, let's do this and then let's write a user manual. The goal should be, let's get it to where you don't have to have a user manual. Let's, uh, let's do FAQs 
And then let's, let's work on those FAQs so that they're no longer Qs, right? We, we don't want to have FAQs. We'd rather have none. So keep iterating your product so that it's so intuitive that you don't need to have instructions or questions or tech support or things like that. That's very, very difficult to do. We got to the point one time in our payment screen where we had some really cool features and it was confusing and, and you know, it was a, it was a um, difficult process, but these guys, you know, hammered on, hammered on, hammered on to where it's, you know, very simple and intuitive and will continue to do that always because in our world, payment, is really just the three boxes on a check. When, to who, and how much. Those are hard to mess up. Well, lots of variations of that. So you should think what we're doing is really easy, but when you put social into it, we will iterate social functions for the entire history of Zipline. So these are the three things that I would say, you know, these are kind of the three takeaways. Choose the correct lens, the community lens, Choose the correct process. Maybe think about study, ship, and determine instead of study, determine, and ship. And choose the correct focus. And the focus will always be human and intuitive in the way that it looks. Um, the, 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 the thing that I want to get across and the thing that makes us better is that uh, we challenge each other at our little company not to be lazy and just say this feature, we need this feature or we need this thing. We've built features already that we realize people don't use because we thought they were great. But then we're learning and we're learning what to do and what not to do and which things uh, garner or which things engender the kind of emotions we want to engender. You know, are you building something that's supposed to be fun? Make it fun. Are you building something that's supposed to be secure? Then let it, let it kind of feel secure. Uh, does it need to be trusted? Does it need, what is the, does it need to be warm? What are the things that it needs to be to connect with humans on an emotional level. There's a guy um, that we like, and he's working with us now, at a company called MailChimp. And MailChimp, um, he, he wrote a book called Designing for Emotion. His name's Aaron Walter. And it's really interesting about how there is, as much as we don't think about it with technology, an emotional connection between you and your audience when they're looking at that screen, whether it be their smartphone or their tablet or their, or their PC. So try to connect with these on this level. Um, we're gonna be around, uh, I'll just wrap up, I'm, we're, we're a few minutes early. We're gonna be around if you have any questions about what we're doing. We're in, our, our product is in beta for about another month. So if you, we love, we're in the we need feedback mode and um, would love to have any of you in our beta. It, and so if you'd like a beta invitation, come throw me a card or, you know, uh, I, I, my Twitter address is up here. Just say, hey, I'd like a beta invitation. And you can either private message me or just put your email address and we'll send you a beta invitation to, uh, to get on Zipline. We're doing some, uh, the MailChimp guy, like we said, where he worked with a team. We're doing some rebranding over the next month and we're gonna kind of egg, emerge from beta and, and keep developing from the tiny startup we are and, and hope we, we can uh, flourish from there. But the feedback that we get now, that, that process of study, ship, determine, that we've shipped it, but now we're going to determine what really works and what really doesn't work, and we need good people for that. So that's, that, that would be, uh, we'd be grateful for that. Thanks. Cool. Ugh. Thank you, sir. Yeah, hello again. All right, I had a curious question because someone asked me and I didn't know. How many of you are first-time attendees this year? Wow. Wow, that's impressive. No, that's, well, well, thanks to Victor for clapping. No, that's impressive. So we've been trying to reach more and more audience areas. Um, it's just interesting to see so many new faces that I hadn't seen before. So I'm glad all of you made it here. Hopefully you're gonna enjoy the rest of the time. So logistics, some people didn't understand. When I had the tracks up earlier and I had administration development, all that, that is actually the room letters. So room A is all the administration sessions. That's the name of the room in the hotel itself. The conference center is room A. So A is the administration track. C is the connect track. D is development and E is everything else. Uh, we have break 
in the atrium now. As we reset, move everybody across, it takes you guys forever to get coffee and walk across. But please visit the sponsors for sure. Uh, also, inside of your bags, I did mention there's other stuff, but there's also like a bingo card that's in there. That is as you visit the sponsors. We're doing some drawings for some prizes around those. Session started at 11 with one of my favorite titles ever, ever, ever of Crouching Firewall Hidden Proxy. <laughs> I don't care if you're a developer or an administrator or a strategist or whatever, that is an awesome title for a session. Uh, the other rooms will have Chris Baker doing uh, the first one in the Connect Track for lower operational costs. We have the Matt White, who came all the way from London to present to you guys. Um, <laughs> alternative X Page Frameworks, I don't know what that is. And then uh, what's next at IBM Same Time in the uh, Everything Else Track. So you guys will be able to pick. So you have a good, by the time we get out of here and get over there, a little over half an hour, there's coffee, there's tea, there's water, there's sponsors. This is the first time to get and see them as well. We do a session, we do lunch, then we do sessions and a break all afternoon. I wanna thank you guys again, Lewis Richardson, definitely for coming. <laughs> Kirk Bowman, Zipline, wanna thank Kirk. If you don't know where you're going, find somebody in a black shirt, but otherwise back across the walkway and down, use both sides of the elevators or otherwise you'll be there forever. We'll see you guys in a few minutes, all right?